attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Dead comments, life halos, and comedy wildlife, plus this day in history with Deep Throat and our song of the day by the charlatans on Your Morning Monarchy for May 31st, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another hour-long listener-supported blast of media brought to you by you. Coming to you live, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Peak, Portland, Oregon. It's a couple seconds after 9 a.m. Glad you join us. We are broadcasting live on our very own damn stream. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Click that link. It should open your iTunes, VLC, Windows Media Player. You can even play it in a browser. Thanks for giving me a couple days off. I needed a couple days off. We all need a couple days off, like Huey Lewis used to say. Got to sleep in a little bit. Got to cook. Got to clean. Got to do house domestic stuff. Good times. Not very good times here in Portland, Oregon, as you may have heard. Pretty horrific acts of murder and mayhem happening on Friday. Turn it into the big city I never wanted to move to. I suppose we can talk a little bit about that. I can see on the sidebar here my lame stream headlines. Max train stabbings echo vicious 1988 Portland murder when city was skinhead capital. Now, I do actually recall when I'd made the decision we were going to move here. Cassie had already moved here and then I was going to follow suit. I suddenly started seeing, you know, watching TV at my parents' house while I was in the middle of the move. You see these documentaries about Portland, skinhead capital of the world, murder and mayhem. It was almost like a lot of cities were in the 80s. Crime holes. Again, we are brought to you by you, my friends. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. PayPal, Patreon, Bitcoin, a post office box, any number of ways you can help support our independent non-commercial work. We've been doing this for almost 12 years and you've never heard an ad, and it is all brought to you by you. And a huge thanks to all our patrons and supporters and donors. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. If you can give a little, I can give a lot, my friends. And also a huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app and the growing community at RadioConfluence.com. So I've teased about something called War Machine. And I think I mentioned a little bit about it Friday. Now the word I've gotten, womp womp. I'm not in it. So long story short, last year, a production company reached out to me and said, hey, we'd like to use a sample of your voice from your new show, New World Next Week, where you're reading an article written by Kurt Nemo, and we want to use the line where you say, the farce that is the war in Afghanistan is coming apart at the seams. I was like, sure. Use me up. Of course, they're not going to pay me for any of that, and if I would have asked for money, they would have said, yeah, thanks, no thanks. Sign the release form, of course, giving them <laughs> giving them rights in perpetuity throughout the universe to use that forever. But I had somebody tell me they watched it. Oh, they said they sat through it twice and that it wasn't actually very good and didn't hear me. So they said it was supposed to be towards the end of the film where the McChrystal, a.k.a. the Brad Pitt character, gets called back to the White House and there's this news montage that you hear over the audio. And that's supposed to be where I was in there. But I guess we didn't make it, my friends. Womp womp. Better luck next time. Again, it is Wednesday morning, May 31st, 2017. We are back here to shut the month down, and I'm going to do a little bit of a, a mixture. Now, typically, each day, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday's world news, Tuesday's tech, and Wednesday is food, health, and environment news we call Food World Order. So we'll be here tomorrow for June 1st for your dark and disturbing Holy Hexes episode, and of course, Friday for your Media Memes Day, where we look at the entertainment industrial complex. But since we missed Monday and Tuesday this week, I'm going to plug in a couple of geopolitics and a couple of cyberspace war articles. So we'll go from the war machines on Earth out to the war machines they want to launch in space, and then we'll come back to Earth for a little bit of food, health, and environment news. Let's take a glance at the breaking lamestream news, my friends. Kabul blast kills 80 near diplomatic area in Afghanistan. Saying au revoir to the Paris Climate Accords. And another blown up artificial freakout. As quote unquote comedian Kathy Griffin does a photo shoot with a bloody Trump mask. Fairly graphic, it actually does look like him. And of course that's not the first time people have joked about harming the president. But it's just, it's okay to do it now. A lot of people said the scariest thing about the photos was how old Kathy Griffin looks. 
Google's breakdown of what Americans don't know how to spell state by state as the National Spelling Bee kicks off today. I'll have to look at that later to see what the most misspelled word in West by God, Virginia is, as well as here in Oregon. And this sounds like a real sticky wicket. Philippines Duterte denounces Chelsea Clinton over rape criticism. File that under the Department of Glass Houses. So some of the other peak Portland articles. Our mayor, Ted Wheeler, who doesn't actually live in the city, he lives in Vancouver, Washington, where he gets much, much lower taxes. And then he comes into the city where we don't have sales tax. So that's the way you swing it if you can. You work in Portland with no sales tax, and then you go back in Washington where the property taxes are much lower. So we don't have sales tax in Portland, but they screw you later. Hashtag taxation is theft. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler under fire after asking feds to revoke permit for pro-Trump rally. Now, I never heard that it was actually a pro-Trump rally. I heard it was a free speech rally. But given the situation that this city is in after Friday's murders at the train stop, you guys, it's disturbingly close how close that train station is. We've been there many, 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 many times. Now, I often watch a Twitter account called PDX Alerts. And it has sort of all the unofficial police dispatch things that you can get quite a hoot out of, like any city or any mid-sized place. Especially when it starts to turn summer, things start to get nutty and you can have a good hoot at some of the police stories. What I have noticed is the bad shit gets closer and closer and closer. You used to be able to look at it and go, oh, well, that's out on 120th. Now it's way down, way, way, way down in the double digits. What I didn't know is that the Terry Shrunk Plaza, which is one of the plazas, one of the parks, one of the places people can do things here in the city. It's actually owned by the feds. So even the Portland mayor has to go to the feds and ask them to revoke the permit for a city park. So that's a whole other interesting area of investigation. Probably file it under all the things that cities and towns and states all give over to the feds. All your parks are belong to the feds. So again, you are listening to your Morning Monarchy. Glad you're here. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We are trying out the new Discord chat. We're over there. Hasn't got... We haven't, haven't figured it all out exactly. And as I've mentioned too, we have a friend passing through town here very soon who might help build our own chat solution. So you can listen live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, and you can always reach out to me, James at MediaMonarchy.com. I'm on Skype. I'm on Wire. We'll still use the Mixler chat. We are over in Discord. And again, hope you're doing safe as we shut down the very not merry month of May. And we'll begin with death being a fact of life, my friends. Civilian casualties are inevitable in the war against the Islamic State group. But the United States is doing everything humanly possible to avoid them, U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mad Dog Mattis said in an interview aired on Sunday. A U.S.-led international coalition has been carrying out airstrikes against the ISIS group in Iraq and Syria since 2014, and non-governmental organizations say the attacks are claiming ever more civilian lives. Interviewed on the Columbia Broadcasting System's Face the Nation, Mad Dog Mattis said that civilian casualties are a fact of life in this sort of situation, but quickly added that we do everything humanly possible consistent with military necessity, taking many chances to avoid civilian casualties at all costs. The offensive in Mosul is taking place as American forces are picking up the tempo against ISIS. Yeah, offensive being the operative word. You can go watch that whole eight-minute clip with Face the Nation, as again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes. Some NGOs, that's where the action is, my friends. you got to all get into nonprofit think tanks and NGOs. That's how you butter that bread up. Some NGOs have blamed the rising civilian death toll on a push by President Donald Trump's administration to accelerate the pace in an effort to annihilate the extremists. But the Pentagon contests both the NGOs' death counts and the charge that a new sense of urgency under Trump is to blame. We have not changed the rules of engagement. There is no relaxation of our intention to protect the innocent. Whew, that's deep. That's rich. Still, Mattis added, quote, probably the most important thing we're doing now is accelerating this fight. 
You just said you weren't doing that. We're accelerating the tempo of it. We're going to squash the enemy's ability to give some indication that they're that they have invulnerability, that they can exist, that they can send people off to Istanbul, to Belgium, to Great Britain and kill people with impunity. The coalition has officially acknowledged responsibility for more than 450 civilian deaths since its bombing campaign began in 2014, including 105 in the Iraqi city of Mosul on March 17th. As you heard that news repeater begin that face the nation clip however air wars the london-based collective of journalists and researchers that track civilian deaths in iraq and syria reports that coalition strikes have killed at least 3,681 although the pentagon last thursday acknowledged that the american bombing attack in mosul on march 17th claimed at least 105 civilian lives it blamed munitions stored by the is militants in the houses targeted so it wasn't us it was just all the shit in your house that blew up that killed you. It wasn't our fault. You all saw him. He had a gun. That, Mad Dog Mattis said on Sunday, showed once again the callous disregard that is characterized by every operation they have run. Now, as our buddy Richard Grove pointed out a long, long time ago, a lot of times, maybe sometimes just a fun or disturbing exercise, think about and interpret the things they say as though they are describing themselves. That's a pretty decent way to do that. They are the multi-generational serial killers. So that's your world news. And hell, if I had to pick just one geopolitics world news to cover, civilian deaths being a fact of life, it's tough to top that one, my friends. But I'll see if I can as we go from geopolitics to a little bit of cyberspace war. As the war over the fate of America's free and open internet, quote-unquote, lumbers on, it appears that po opponents of net neutrality will do anything in their power to turn control of the internet over to massive telecom companies, as if they don't already have it, including committing fraud. As detailed in a letter sent to the FCC Thursday morning, people are pissed that their personal information was used without their knowledge to post anti-net neutrality comments to the FCC's website, which includes at least two people who are recently deceased. Late last month, the FCC opened up its website for comment on Restoring Internet Freedom, an anti-net neutrality proposal that was advanced by FCC Chairman Ajit Pai and has found wide support among conservative members of Congress. In the weeks that followed, the FCC's website has been flooded with over two and a half million comments about the proposal. Before Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai can roll back regulations meant to preserve net neutrality and open internet standards, he had to put his proposal up for public comment. It's not going well. The Restoring Internet Freedom proposal is still open for comment until mid-August, but it's already swamped with submissions, and many of them aren't legit. More than 128,000 comments just posted the same statement criticizing net neutrality under different names over and over again. ZDNet reports that's likely to be the work of a robot. The outlet contacted several of the named posters who said they didn't leave any messages with the FCC. Recode also notes around 30,000 similarly boilerplate comments supporting net neutrality came from a form submission site run by a nonprofit. Public interest in the proposal hit a high point after comedian John Oliver used his HBO show to encourage comments on the FCC's website. The agency says a flood of traffic took its website offline shortly after the program aired. On Thursday... 14 people who say their identity was inappropriately used to oppose net neutrality without their permission wrote a letter demanding that Pi and the FCC open an investigation into the alleged astroturfing campaign. Whoever's behind this stole our names and addresses, publicly exposed our private information without our permission, and used our identities to file a political statement we did not sign on to. While it may be convenient for you to ignore this, given that it was done in an attempt to support your position, it cannot be the case that the FCC moves forward on such a major public debate without properly investigating this known attack. It's uncertain how these individuals' personal information was obtained, but it appears that a significant portion of their names and addresses used to post these comments were called from government files stolen during a number of different network breaches over the years. Which one? Could be any number of them. Many of the addresses associated with these people's names are outdated, and according to the digital rights group Fight for the Future, 
In at least two of the cases, a comment was filed to the FCC's website by people who recently died. The organization behind this anti-net neutrality spam is uncertain, as is the exact number of fake comments. Friends of recently deceased individuals confirmed their friends could not have posted the comments posthumously. I'm glad we have that little bit of backup. The friends have confirmed that their dead friends didn't post these comments. Now, I've made the references, I think, here on this show. You gotta look in your junk mail every now and then just to make sure you're not missing some stuff. Whether you're expecting it or not. And I still get emails from my dead buddy, Robert. He died of cancer five years ago. But he still sends me bizarre, nonsensical messages that end up in my junk folder. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, May 31st, 2017. Shut the month down as we go from geopolitics to cyberspace war and as we blast off into space. Civilian deaths on Earth are just a fact of life. Maybe we can find some potential life elsewhere, they say. Scientists say they've made a discovery on Mars that may indicate the potential for life on the red planet. Hold your breath. According to a new paper published in Geophysical Research Letters, higher concentration of silica called halos have been found in the Gale Crater on Mars, G-A-L-E. In a press release, the American Geophysical Union says the halos indicate that the planet had water much longer than previously believed. The concentration of silica is very high at the center lines of these halos, says Jens Friedenvang, a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory and the University of Copenhagen and lead author of the new study. NASA's Curiosity rover mission has been to find out if Mars was ever habitable. Scientists say Curiosity's mission has been very successful in showing that Gale Crater once held a lake with drinkable water. Ever since NASA's Curiosity rover landed on Mars in 2012, it's been looking for answers to the same question. Did the red planet ever harbor life? It's already showed us there was once a large lake with drinkable water, but we don't know how long this potentially life-supporting environment endured. New research by Los Alamos National Laboratory now tells us liquid water flowed through the bedrock of the planet for longer than previously believed. Planetary scientists at Los Alamos have found light-toned bedrock with high concentrations of silica surrounding the fractures in the rock in Gale Crater on Mars. The concentration of silica is very high at the center lines of these so-called halos and likely originates from silica migrating from very old sedimentary bedrock into younger overlying rock as water flowed through them. This means that even when the lake eventually evaporated, substantial amounts of groundwater remained. Because water is a key condition for life, this finding expands the window of time when organisms might have lived on Mars. The study of the halos was led by a Los Alamos scientist looking at data from the rover's science payload, including the laser shooting ChemCam instrument that was developed at Los Alamos in conjunction with the French Space Agency. Los Alamos's work on instruments like ChemCam stems from the laboratory's experience building and operating more than 500 spacecraft instruments for national defense. Whether this groundwater sustained life remains to be seen, but this research, and more like it, sheds new light on the mysteries of the Red Planet's ancient past. I can't believe you guys still believe in water. So that's the jaunty little piece from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And again, we'll have the link to that original research paper at Geophysical Research Letters as we continue on on your morning monarchy. With a little bit of good news, a federal appeals court has unanimously reversed part of a lower court's dismissal of a lawsuit filed by the American Civil Liberties Union for Wikimedia, which challenges the NSA's mass surveillance and collection of internet communications. The suit was originally filed in 2015 by the ACLU on behalf of the Wikimedia Foundation, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch. Not the greatest of groups, among others, and they were centered around NSA's upstream surveillance program, which intercepts data from the internet backbone cables carrying the online messages, web searches, and emails of U.S. citizens. Upstream operates under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the FISA Act, a statute the government uses to conduct warrantless surveillance on Americans who communicate with targets located outside the United States, quote-unquote. The case was shot down in October 2015 when U.S. District Judge T.S. Eliot... No, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> My brain just finished that. T.S. Ellis. Did it have the first four letters of Elliot? E-L-L-I-S. T.S. Ellis the third 
ruled that the case was based on the subjective fear of surveillance at the time claiming the plaintiffs had not ale- had not alleged facts that plausibly established that the NSA is using upstream surveillance to copy all or substantially all communications passing through those checkpoints in this regard plaintiffs can only speculate however on Tuesday The Fourth Circuit Appeals Court ruled that Wikimedia Foundation had adequately provided a basis for their claims, allowing them to move forward with the lawsuit. The NSA's indiscriminate copying and searching through Americans' international communications imposes a chilling effect on basic freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, the freedom of inquiry, and it also is an invasion of Americans' right to privacy in those communications. We have long operate in this country on a basic rule that the government does not search your home, your papers, and today your emails when you've done nothing wrong. And the flip side of that rule is that the government must go to a court with individualized suspicion when it wants access to those materials. Our challenge asserts Fourth Amendment claims for the violation of Americans' privacy, First Amendment claims for its effect on Americans' right to free expression and free inquiry, and it also asserts that the uh, challenge spying program goes beyond the authority that Congress gave the NSA when it passed a controversial spying law in 2008. The judge's decision stated, quote, Wikimedia has plausibly alleged that its communications travel all the roads that a communication can take and that the NSA seizes all of the communications along at least one of those roads. Thus, at least at this stage of the litigation, Wikimedia has standing to sue for a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And because Wikimedia has self-censored its speech and sometimes foregone electronic communications in response to upstream surveillance, it also has standing to sue for a violation of the First Amendment. By a two-to-one vote, the panel also ruled that the plaintiffs lack standing to move forward. Circuit Judge Albert Diaz noted that since the other organizations have smaller digital footprints, it's harder for them to plausibly establish that the NSA is intercepting substantially all text-based communications. Nevertheless, ACL attorney Patrick Toomey, I wonder if he's related to, is it Jeffrey? No, no, that's Tubin. Nevertheless, ACLU attorney Patrick Toomey, who argued the appeal in December 2016, called the court's decision an important victory for the rule of law. Our government shouldn't be searching the private communications of innocent people in bulk, examining the contents of America's emails and chats day in, day out. This mass surveillance threatens the foundations of a free internet. Did that free internet ever actually exist in the first place? Now, since I've been accused of being a corporate crony, a part of the Bitcoin bit scam cult, I'll give you some Bitcoin updates. The price of the world's most popular cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, lost over a fifth of its value from the record high of last week. On Monday, Bitcoin was trading at 2179, down 612 from last Wednesday's all time high of 2791. The correction was actually quite brief. The prices today are still higher than that of a week ago. Bitcoin continues to fall after it hit a record high of 2,700 U.S. dollars on Thursday. On Saturday, it dropped below 2,000 U.S. dollars, and today it is currently around 2,100. All of the leading cryptocurrencies have suffered losses over the past 24 hours. Ah, I'm such a Bitcoin shill. Bitcoin sees $4 billion in value wiped out as the price of cryptocurrency falls 20%. We do accept Bitcoin. We also have a post office box. Oh, God. He's such a USPS shill. Can you believe that? He believes in water and a post office box. (laughs) These are the ridiculous accusations and harassment you'll have to go through if you actually try and make things yourself and express your ideas. You'll find they're generally left by people who have nothing to add themselves. They just basically use comment fields to bloviate all their bile. In the words of the Beastie Boys, keep talking shit because it just makes me strong. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, giving you a Food World Order edition sprinkled with a little bit of geopolitics and cyberspace war. And those cyberspace wars work their way, way, way right in to our Food World Order news, which sort of officially begins right now. A tech security evaluation has found that a whopping 8,000 software vulnerabilities exist in the code of pacemakers. Security research firm Whitescope 
carried out the assessment on implantable cardiac devices, physician programmers, and home monitoring devices for four major manufacturers. The researchers found a worrying consistency across all vendors, highlighting inherent system weaknesses in the file system encryption and storage of unencrypted patient data. The report notes that pacemaker security faces, uh, quote, some serious challenges. The recent WannaCry ransomware attack, which reportedly infected a medical device in a U.S. hospital, as well as medical services in the U.S. and the U.K., once again highlighted the potential implications of software vulnerabilities in the health sector. This new study builds on earlier research, which raised concerns over security flaws in cardiac devices such as the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD if you're nasty, and the pacemaker. With white scope, researchers easily able to obtain some systems, subsystems, for the four major vendors through public auction sites such as eBay. One particular concern is the use of third-party components, software that is sold by a company other than the original vendor. These components often, often, often have vulnerabilities that go unpatched. The report notes that as home monitoring devices receive updates to their permanent software or firmware via the patient support network, quote, the potential exists to perform a man-in-the-middle attack and issue counterfeit firmware to the devices. It's Health Watch. We've all heard about hackers hitting computer networks, banks, and even cars. Well, now a warning that hackers could hit people's hearts. CBS 2's Dr. Max Gomez tells us that pacemakers are vulnerable. Dr. Max? That's right, Jessica and Alice. You know, not just pacemakers, all sorts of medical devices run wirelessly off computer networks. And even though many of these devices are lifesavers or life supporters, they are surprisingly unprotected against cyber attack. If you feel vulnerable when you're in the hospital, it turns out you've got company. So is the hospital itself. It's a medical device, but the way this thing runs is really just a computer. Cybersecurity expert Billy Rio says many medical devices, such as this IV pump, are connected wirelessly to a centralized computer network, making it easier to monitor. But that also means... By design, you're allowing it to where someone else can control this thing remotely and do things to the pump or to do things to the device or equipment. You have to understand what you're doing before you do this. Rios examined a number of popular hospital infusion pumps and the results were chilling. You could basically log into this device with no username and no password. Which means just about any hacker with an internet connection could remotely operate the device or change its settings. The same is reportedly true of people's personal medical devices, such as insulin pumps and heart pacemakers. The danger is serious enough that former Vice President Dick Cheney had his pacemaker's wireless function disabled. But Rios says most devices Device manufacturers are slow to fix what they consider only theoretical problems. You know, normally what has to happen is we have to wait for someone to be killed, right? So, uh, and that's, that's not a good position to be in. We don't want someone to have to die in order for them to become a data point in order for us to make a decision. Because of Rios' research, the FDA has issued an alert warning health providers to discontinue use of some specific IV pumps. But because there's no actual defect, there was no requirement to do so, which also means there is no guarantee that that the person controlling your life-saving device is someone with your best interest at heart. Now, part of the problem is who's going to pay the cost of adding security to an old machine, which can get expensive when hospitals could easily have dozens or even hundreds of IV infusion pumps. Manufacturers may only offer a fix if hospitals purchase new models for them. Now, again, this hasn't happened. It's unusual, but you don't want to wait for something really bad to happen before you add some kind of a cybersecurity there. It's kind of wide open right now. Mm. Who would have, would have thought? Yeah, something to look out well, for. Well, I think that's part of the problem. Nobody really thought yeah. about it, that they're all operating on a computer network, and that network is vulnerable, so you can get into it via the network. Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening live to your Morning Monarchy, last day of May 2017, my friends. I am James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more from the mighty MediaMonarchy.com kingdom. Now let's get to the good stuff, right? Aphrodisiacs, ah, shit, recalled. An instant coffee marketed as a natural herbal aphrodisiac is under recall nationwide after the report of one death and a finding by the FDA that it contains prescription drugs for treatment of erectile dysfunction. Caverflow. Caverflow? C A V E R F L O dot com. Caverflow posted the recall of 25 gram packets of Caverflow Natural Herbal Coffee Thursday with the FDA. 
FDA laboratory analysis confirmed the president presence of sildenafil and tadalafil, which are the active ingredients in two FDA-approved prescription drugs used for the treatment of erectile dysfunction, or ED, if you're nasty. Caverflows received a report of an individual death after use of the coffee. Caverflow natural herbal coffee may be may also contain undeclared milk. You should always remember to declare your milk. I was laughing looking at our package of sardines we picked up from the store the other day. It contains fish. Good thing. The product's a combination of instant coffee and natural aphrodisiacs, according to the Caverflow website. But the recall notice also warned the product can interact with prescription medications. Also, people who have an allergy or severe sensitivity to milk could have an allergic reaction if they consume the instant coffee. Good googly moogly. But these are the sorts of things that you kind of buy over the counter at the gas station, at the shitball grocery store. You kind of should know better what well, we were joking about that the other day. That court case in the TV show The League. You should have known better than to eat that food from the 7-Eleven. Speaking of grocery store, speaking of grocery shopping, and again, I, I, I've, I have loved being more and more of a house husband. All my jobs pretty much back in the day were all kitchen related. So as much as it was a little bit of a transition to quit my commercial radio job and start to work from home, so that means media monarchy 9 to 5, but that pretty much means houseboy before and after that. I've taken over a bit of the cooking and cleaning and the operations of the house. I kind of dig it. I kind of like it. That's all just to say we're talking food world order stories <laughs> and wondering about shortages of things. Like a baking soda shortage? Yes. As I glance in the chat over at Discord, if you want to check out Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D app.com. The dishes are done, man. <laughs> a cartel combined with absurd government regulations can look a lot like a doomed socialist state at times. In Venezuela, for example, there are shortages of food, toilet paper, medicines, etc. Pretty standard stuff, comrade. But in the U.S., how is it possible that there's a shortage of solutions of sodium bicarbonate? Keywords from the coming article, the country's two suppliers. This isn't a market system. What you have here is a ministry of baking soda with two divisions. This article via Ars Technica, brought to us by the always awesome Cryptagon.com. Amid a national shortage of critical medicine, U.S. hospitals are hoarding vials, delaying surgery, and turning away patients. The medicine in short supply? Solutions of sodium bicarbonate, a.k.a. baking soda. The simple drug is used in all sorts of treatments from chemotherapies to those for organ failure. It can help correct the pH of blood and ease the pain of stitches. It's used in open heart surgery, can help reverse poisonings, and is kept on emergency crash carts. But however basic and life-saving, the drug has been in short supply since around February. The country's two suppliers... Pfizer and Amphastar, A-M-P-H-A-S-T-A-R. Pfizer and Amphastar ran low following an issue with one of Pfizer's suppliers. The issue was undisclosed due to confidentiality agreements. Does that make you feel safe? Amphastar supplies took a hit with a spike in demand from desperate Pfizer customers. Both companies told the New York Times that they don't know when exactly supplies will be restored. They speculate that it will be no earlier than June or August. Not to mention July. As hospitals and pharmacists struggle with the sodium bicarbonate shortage, experts note that it's just the latest example of stocks of inexpensive, essential generic medicines hitting alarming lows. For example, there was a sodium bicarbonate scarcity in 2012 and a similarly alarming shortage of saline solution in 2014. Again, those experts blame the shortages on a combination of factors, including problems getting raw materials, issues with aging facilities where many old drugs are manufactured, and consolidation in the industry that reduces the number of potential suppliers. There's also concern that because generic drugs are unlikely to drive profits, drug companies might not make necessary investments to maintain their supplies. Speaking of not maintaining your supplies, and we've talked about this recently, the massive companies are contracting. That's why they're on the murder and execution spree. 
Mergers and acquisitions are the only thing that are going to keep these fuckers alive. I, I, I often think about XM and Sirius. They're the same thing now, and you know why? Because neither was going to survive unless they merged. That's what's going to happen to a lot of these food world order chemical poison companies. Because people aren't buying their crap anymore. So one, that's why they're consolidating. That's why they're shutting down stores. That's why they're laying off hundreds of people. Two, that's why they're buying up ready-to-sell-out companies. A move by Kellogg Company to end its model of shipping directly to retail stores will affect nearly 500 workers in North Carolina. The cereal and snack manufacturer expects to close distribution centers in Charlotte and Greensboro by mid-August, according to two worker adjustment and retraining notification filings. The notices were filed Friday with the North Carolina Department of Commerce. The closures will result in 233 employees losing their jobs at the warehouse on West Point Drive in West Charlotte, in addition to 250 layoffs in Greensboro. The first wave of cuts impacting all employees at the distribution centers is scheduled for July 29th through my birthday, August 11th. Workers employed in the company's Snacks Retail Executive Division, many of whom don't physically work at the centers, they'll be laid off between August 4th and 17th. Kellogg's laying off 500 in Charlotte and Greensboro this summer. Then we flip to the mergers. J.M. Smucker will acquire the Wesson oil brand from ConAgra in a $285 million all-cash transaction, according to a company statement. Smucker expects the acquisition to add annual net sales of approximately $230 million. Per terms of the agreement, ConAgra will continue to make products sold under the Wesson brand and will assist with the company's transition for up to one year following the transaction's close. After this period, Smucker plans to consolidate Wesson production into its existing edible oils manufacturing facility in Cincinnati. The addition of Wesson creates a strong complement to our Crisco brand, CEO Mark Smucker said in the company statement. By allowing us to more efficiently use existing supply chain and go-to market resources, this acquisition will blah 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 bling bong They know they're struggling. They're not going to disappear tomorrow, but they know they are struggling. And it's tough to keep up with all of it. Now, again, it's easy to, in a lot of ways, stop buying this crap. you got to think about what the next move you're going to get. What the next thing, what are you going to replace it with? I know we ain't going to pl- replace it with potatoes out of Maine. Maine, the state of Maine, just became the last state in the nation to approve the use of three new types of genetically modified potatoes. That's the N8 Generation 2 Russet Burbank, the Ranger Russet, and the Atlantic Potato Varieties. The Maine Board of Pesticides Control approved the new potatoes, which they were developed by an Idaho-based company. So there's your alert as Maine has approved three types of GMO potatoes. Three new types of genetically engineered potatoes will soon find their way to American dinner tables. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency approved three types of genetically engineered potatoes last week. The Ranger Russet, Atlantic, and Russet Burbank are apparently immune to the same pathogen that caused the infamous Irish potato famine. Federal officials say they're completely safe to eat. They have only potato genes and get their disease resistance from a type of potato in Argentina that naturally produces a defense. The potatoes are also reportedly less likely to bruise, have a much longer shelf life, and contain lower levels of a chemical that is capable of causing cancer when cooked at high temperatures. Growing them also requires fewer pesticides. The Idaho-based company responsible for the super spuds, J.R. Simplot, now has the green light to plant the potatoes this spring and and sell them in the fall. Uh, in other news, federal authorities have said the air is safe to breathe at ground zero. Our penultimate story here on your morning monarchy for May 31st. Sort of a geopolitics, cyberspace war, food world order edition. America's beekeepers watched as a third of the country's honeybee colonies were lost over this last year. Of course, part of the decade-long die-off experts said may threaten our food supply. It's a pretty heavy opening sentence for an article. The annual survey of roughly 5,000 beekeepers showed the 33% dip from April 2016 to April 2017. The decrease is small compared to the survey's previous decade when the decrease hovered at around 40%. From 2012 to 2013, nearly half of the nation's colonies died. I would stop short of calling this good news. 
says Dennis Van Engelsdorp, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. I've seen concerts there. Colony loss of more than 30% over the entire year is high. It's hard to imagine any other agriculture sector being able to stay in business with such consistently high losses. The research, published Thursday, is the work of the nonprofit Be Informed Partnership and the Apiary Inspectors of America. The death of a colony doesn't necessarily mean a loss of bees, explains Van Engelsdorp, a project director at the Bee Informed Partnership. A beekeeper can salvage a dead colony, but doing so comes at labor and productivity costs. That causes beekeepers to change to rather to charge farmers more for pollinating crops and creates a scarcity of bees available for pollination. It's a trend that threatens beekeepers trying to make a living and could lead to a drop off in fruits and nuts reliant on pollination. One in every three bites of food, Van Engelsdorp said, is directly or indirectly pollinated by honeybees, who pollinate about $15 billion worth of U.S. crops every year. Almonds, for instance, are completely reliant on honeybee pollination. Keeping bees healthy is essentially in order to meet that demand. He said there are concerns if it don't and won't. So, asks USA Today, the musical question, what's killing the honeybees? Parasites, diseases, poor nutrition, and pesticides, among many others. The chief killer that they say is the varroa mite a lethal parasite which researchers said spreads among colonies. This is a complex problem, said Maryland graduate student Kelly Kuhanik, who assisted with the study. Lower losses are a great start, but it's important to remember that 33% is still much higher than beekeepers deem acceptable. There is still much work to do. Van Engelsdorp said people can do their part to save bee colonies by buying honey from a local beekeeper, becoming a beekeeper, avoid using pesticides in your yard, and making room for pollinators such as honeybees in your yard. Bees are good indicators of the landscape as a whole, says Natalie Steinhauer, who led data collection on this project. To keep healthy bees, you need a good environment and you need your neighbors to keep healthy bees. Honeybee health is a community matter. Now, what a great illustration of community matters. Oh my God, what could I possibly do to save bees? Well, what if you put some skin in the game and become a beekeeper and support your local beekeeper? We got a local beekeeper that hangs out in the chat sometimes, and they have been a longtime supporter of Media Monarchy, even sending us containers of honey through the years. That's our buddy Steven over in Oklahoma. Huge thanks to him. And you probably know a local beekeeper. I imagine you probably run in those scenes. Also, I probably don't have to point out to you, eating local honey is a very important part of your own health. You shouldn't buy it off the shelf from some national place. You want to make sure it's coming from the closest place possible. And it's just good. And it can help you replace terrible sugars. You can just use honey. That's all pretty much Cassie puts in her coffee. Speaking of Cassie, our final story here comes via her. I also heard horrific Food World Order stories that we didn't include on this show, like the awful diarrhea incident at that strip club in North Carolina. I thought you said you weren't going to mention it, but there it is. It's the hilarious winners of the first annual Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards. Grabbing this story from flowartstation.com, I think these things are generally important. I know, I'm talking about visuals on the radio. It's a really great idea, right? <laughs> That's why you gotta go check out the show notes on each and every episode, because you can see these articles and you can get that research, whether it's the research about dead people voting, life on Mars, Dead honeybees. You also got to check out these pictures of Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards. Little fat-cheeked mice running. I think the one we're probably going to pick for our album art today. So there's a deer with a giant rack of horns and his face all covered in ferns and stuff. Like he's trying to be disguised. Or they got stuck on his horns and he can't get them off. Also, I'm a big fan of the gorilla just... Digging, just knuckle deep for nose gold, just picking his nose away. And these are the fun things you got to look at sometimes. We were watching some video the other day about what do you go to online to cheer you up? 
I've actually worked on a little bit of YouTube playlists here and there of just those things that are your pick-you-ups. Things that you always enjoy seeing. I don't know if you've heard, but the world can be a pretty rough-ass place. And we need each other, and we need positivity. That's what I try and do with these shows. Now again, I could have a bajillion more hits if I just publish things, calling everybody fucking idiots, because you believe in this and you believe in that, and I'll use all capital letters, and I'll have thousands of hits, millions of subscribers. But I don't want to do that. I'm not into that. It's not what I want. I've obviously never followed all of the hottest trends, or we wouldn't be sitting here together right now, my friends. (laughs) So there is your morning monarchy for the last day of the month. And again, we took Monday and Tuesday off, so no, nothing was wrong with your feeds. We took those days off to have a little bit of time to ourselves and hope you enjoyed the break off. All those stories, as always, you can get ahead of the showtime. We post them up to the tweeters. So if you're listening live, you can follow along and see all the stories that we're going to talk about. Again, if you're listening live or listening later in a car, in a cube, in a garden, we love and appreciate you being here and spending the time with us. I love being able to close out the show with brand new music from the legendary Charlatans. Now, maybe noted before, as I often do, you know, I grew up in West Virginia. There's no internet. There's shitty radio. I had very little media access. 120 minutes on MTV was hugely important, wildly influential to me. I would tape it every Sunday night. I'd watch it and rewatch it and rewatch it through the week. And by the weekend, I would use my paper route, lawn mowing, dishwashing money to go to the mall and go to Camelot Music and maybe go to Walton Books and maybe go to the movies. I distinctly recall seeing the charlatan's weirdo from their 91, 92 record. Went to the mall that week and bought it on tape. They are back with their umpteenth album called Different Days from the Charlatans. It actually just came out last Friday. And we're going to play a little song called Plastic Machinery from the Charlatans featuring, you know, some guy named Johnny Marr helping out. But first, let's take a stroll down this day in history, my friends. Past is prologue. May 31st, 1790. The United States enacts its first copyright statute, the Copyright Act of 1790. I was reading a little bit of a book. It was a promo copy, and it actually expired on my e-reader, Fondle Slab. It's the story of Aaron Schwartz, but it begins with the entire background of copyright history. It's fascinating. I actually didn't even get to the part where they talk about Aaron Schwartz. It was just all about Webster and the Copyright Act. May 31st, 1859, the clock tower at the Houses of Parliament, which houses Big Ben, starts keeping time. Hey, look, kids. Big Ben. Parliament. May 31st, 1879, Gilmore's Garden in New York City is renamed Madison Square Garden by William Henry Vanderbilt and is open to the public at 26th and Madison Avenue. My brother actually saw Metallica there at MSG a couple days ago. May 31st, 1889, over 2,200 people die after a dam fails and sends a 60-foot wall of water over the town of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. They call it the Johnstown Flood, 1889 on this day. 1909 on this day, the National Negro Committee, the forerunner to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, convenes for the very first time. The Internet's Own Boy, that's what it's called, the story of Aaron Schwartz. I just got a link from our buddy Embers of Liberty. Is that actually the book? It looks like it's going to archive.org, so maybe you can just get a copy of The Internet's Own Boy, The Story of Aaron Schwartz, over on archive.org. I'll tweet that link out in a little bit. Huge thanks, Embers of Liberty, and huge thanks to everybody, again, who takes part in this. You're not some passive person sitting by receiving all the information. You are taking part in this. You are soaking in it, my friends. May 31st, 1927, the last Ford Model T rolls off the assembly line on this day in 1927 after a production run of 15,007,003 vehicles. May 31st, 1956, Buddy Holly was inspired to write That'll Be the Day after he saw the legendary film The Searchers. John Ford, John Wayne. 
May 31st, 1971, in accordance with the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, passed by the U.S. Congress in 1968, observation of Memorial Day occurs on the last Monday in May for the first time, rather than on the traditional Memorial Day of May 30th. And anymore in America, we pretty much just do the holidays on Monday. May 31st, 1976, The Who played at the Charlton Athletic Grounds in England and make the Guinness Book of World Records as the loudest rock band ever. Their set measured 76,000 watts and 120 decibels. One year later, May 31st, 1977, in the UK, the Sex Pistols single God Save the Queen was banned on this day by the British Broadcasting Corporation because sheltering pedophiles is okay, but playing God Save the Queen, not okay. May 31st, 1979, in New York City, the restored Radio City Music Hall was reopened on this day in 1979. 1995, Bob Dole singled out Time Warner for, quote, the marketing of evil. In movies and music, Bob Dole later admitted that he had not seen or heard much of what he had been criticizing. May 31st, 2005. W. Mark Felt's family ends 30 years of speculation identifying Mark Felt, the former FBI assistant director, as Deep Throat, the secret source who had helped unravel the Watergate scandal. The Felt family's admission, made in an article in Vanity Fair magazine, took legendary reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who had promised to keep their source's identity a secret, to his death by surprise. Tapes show that Nixon himself had speculated that Felt was the secret informant as early as 1973. May 31st, 2005, the day America learned the details of one of its biggest secrets. Better known to the public as Deep Throat, Mark Felt, the former associate director of the FBI, revealed he was the man who helped bring down the Nixon administration. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour, in this office. Thursday night at the age of 95, Felt passed away. While the FBI's second-in-command, Felt provided key information to Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein that eventually saw the resignation of President Richard Nixon in 1974. For more than 30 years, Felt denied he was the source who connected the White House to the June 1972 break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters. He wouldn't talk, and my colleague Carl Bernstein and I and others at the Washington Post kept uh, kept our word. Uh, he was insistent that we not disclose, and uh, I think we wanted to protect that principle. Then, in May of 2005, he decided to break his silence. Big grin. Good. Big grin. Did he say anything to you? Big grin. I, I don't even remember, but he's happy. He's happy about it. Critics called Felt a traitor for betraying President Nixon, while supporters hailed him as a hero for blowing the whistle on a corrupt administration. Ultimately, his daughter convinced him to reveal his identity, arguing his secret could pay off the family debts. The two men who held his secret, Woodward and Bernstein, had agreed to never reveal their deep secret until either Deep Throat outed himself or died. John O'Connor, the family friend who wrote the 2005 Vanity Fair article uncovering Felt's secret, says Felt died of congestive heart failure. Now, there's a lot of speculation, and I think even at the time this was happening, I was big into listening to black op radio, and they mostly focus on Kennedy-Nixon era deep state. It did always seem a little strange that, oh, here's this doddering old hundred-year-old man. Yeah, that's me. I did the Iggy. Mark Felt exposed, quote-unquote, as deep throat on this day. Hey, I got it from the uh, corrections department a couple of seconds ago. The Internet's own boy, the story of Aaron Schwartz, is the film. The book I was referring to is called The Idealist, Aaron Schwartz and the Rise of Free Culture on the Internet, written by Justin Peters. Now, as I noted for you Friday, this time a decade ago, see, Media Modern Key was taking a little bit of a vacation a decade ago. I was actually going to the East Coast, and we took much more time off for Media Monarchy than we did on just a little Monday and Tuesday. Celebrating birthdays today? Pretty good group. May 31st, Walt Whitman, Fred Allen, Norman Vincent Peale, Don Amici, 
Julian Beck, as you might know, as Kane from Poltergeist 2. Menachem Golan, one part of the Golan Globus filmmaking empire. It's Clint Eastwood's birthday. Peter Yarrow's birthday of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Sharon Glass, Joe Namath, Brady Bunch Simpson star. Rainier Werner Fassbinder, John Bonham, born on this day, 1948. It's also Martin Hannett, producer, Tom Berenger, Gregory Harrison, as you might remember from Gonzo from Trapper John M&D, Chris Elliott, Leah Thompson, Corey Hart, the late, great Wesley Willis. It's also Daryl DMC McDaniels, Brooke Shields, Phil Amazing Race Keegan, Colin Farrell, and Azalea Banks. Now, I got a pretty awesome, twangy new music set coming up on your Pump Up the Volume featuring brand new music from old 97s and much more. And that's coming up on your daily DJ set at noon. You got hour news in the morning, hour music in the afternoon, and essentially streaming radio from MediaMonarchy.com slash listen 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, my friends. We are building an empire with your help. We're going out with brand new music from the charlatans as we wrap up your morning monarchy for the very merry month of May. May 31st, 2017. It's been your Food World Order edition. And I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you so very much for listening, my friends. And reminding you, as always, don't hate the media. Become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.